Welcome to Neurosalience, the OHBM podcast. Welcome to the Organization for Human Brain Mapping Neurosalience podcast, now in our fifth season. I'm your host, Peter Banatini, and here I explore advances, challenges, controversies, and opportunities in brain imaging and modeling with neuroscientists around the world. Today, it's my pleasure and honor to have Dr. Alan Evans on the podcast. Professor Evans did his PhD in biophysics at Leeds University in the UK, studying 3D protein folding. He then spent five years at the Atomic Energy Group of Canada as a pet physicist. In 1984, he moved to the Montreal Neurological Institute at McGill, where his research interests include multimodal brain imaging with PET or MRI, structural network modeling, and large-scale neuroinformatics. For the past 40 years, Alan has been an institution at McGill University. Today, he is co-director of both the Ludmar Center for Neuroinformatics and Mental Health and the Helmholtz International Brain, Big Brain Analytics Learning Laboratory, otherwise known as Highball. He is scientific director of McGill's $84 million Canada First Research Excellent Fund project uh, called Healthy Brains, Healthy Lives, HBHL, and scientific director of the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform, COMP. The technical infrastructure underpinning COMP includes a multimodal databasing system, LORIS, and an international grid processing portal called Seabrain, both developed in Evans's lab. These platforms also support international brain networks, notably the Canada-China-Cuba axis and the Global Brain Consortium, both co-chaired by Dr. Evans. He co-founded Biospective Incorporated, a contract research organization that offers 3D image analysis for clinical or preclinical pharmaceutical studies. In 2022, he launched a data management spin-off company, Lasso Informatics, that offers tools for multimodal research data management and analysis. Dr. Evans has published over 700 peer review papers. He has an H index in Google. Uh, of 214 and has been recognized as in the top 1% cited scientists for neuroscience and behavior with over about 200,000 citations in, in Google Scholar. He was ranked number six by Science Magazine in its list of most influential brain scientists in the modern era. He's held numerous leadership roles, notably director of the McConnell Brain Imaging Center during the 1990s, he headed the Data Coordinating Center for the NIH-funded multi-center study for normal pediatric development. He is founding member of the International Consortium of Brain Mapping. He was a founder of the Organization for Human Brain Mapping, serving in numerous leadership positions on the OHBM Council since 1995, and was appointed the OHBM Chair in 2017. Over the years, his work has been absolutely pivotal in shaping OHBM to what it is today. This discussion was truly a pleasure as we reminisced on significant events and some special colleagues before getting into discussion on what he's leading today. Throughout this conversation, it's clear that Dr. Evans is a strong proponent of open science, consortium building, and big data, and looks to foster sharing, accessing, and analyzing data by leading the development of consortia platforms and tools with the confident expectation that through work within these infrastructures, we'll develop clinical applications, as well as a deeper understanding of the mechanisms of brain processes, and also perhaps derive insight into the organizing principles of the human brain. So I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Uh, I had a lot of fun and uh, let's uh, get on with it. Today, I'm I have the honor to be with uh, Dr. Alan Evans, and uh, we have a lot to talk about as far as everything from uh, you know the storied past of the Montreal Neurologic Institute and McGill and his past 
and the growing of consortia and uh, platforms. And actually, you know, hopefully we'll move towards talking about understanding the brain and, and uh, sort of where all this hopefully is leading. Um, and then along the way, we'll do some reminiscing probably. So, all right, thanks for, thanks for joining me. It's a, a pleasure, absolute pleasure. All right, so, so why don't we start at the beginning? Uh, one thing that, that I learned uh, is, is that, you know, you're not, you're not a native Canadian. Um, well, actually, I knew that for a long time. Um, and uh, from your constantly cheering on the, uh, the Wales uh, rugby teams uh, <laughs> uh, on Facebook and whatnot. But so, so you grew up in this town of Barry in the Vale of uh, Glamorgan in Wales. And yeah. uh, um, I'm kind of curious about, you know, that I've never known anyone who, who grew up there. So I'm, I'm kind of curious how, how it was growing up and uh, uh, what led you to be interested in physics? And well, I, I grew up as a, just a regular kid in, uh, in Barrie. Um, Barrie, the, the town itself, is, uh, it's got a fascinating history. It was uh, in the 1880s. It was uh, uh, just three small villages with a total population of about 400 people. And then um, the uh, coal barons of Cardiff, the, the major city next to Barrie, decided that uh, they wanted to break the monopoly of the of the port owners, so they built their own port called Barry Island, and they, they, they filled in the gap between the island and the mainland, <laughs> and they put a port there. Uh, ten years uh, later, it was it was done. It was the uh, the largest coal port in the entire British Empire. Huh. It okay. uh, and the town went from four hundred people to uh, uh, twenty five thousand by nineteen ten. Wow. So and so the the town has a very, very long history of uh, of um, seafaring, and it also has a whole series of beaches. And the most important job I've ever had was a deck chair attendant at Barry Island uh, Resort, which is <laughs> kind of like Coney Beach, the same sort of thing. <laughs> and they paid us the same amount of money as the uh, municipal garbage collectors. And we were just sunbathing on the beach, handing out deck chairs. And then <laughs> somewhere along the, uh, the way, my career took the wrong path and I went, ended up in uh, university and uh, then ultimately came here. My, um, the, the backstory there is that my wife is, uh, her father's from my hometown in Wales. Okay. They, they came wow. visiting and we'd never seen a Canadian. So of course we gate crashed a party and, uh, and met my that to become wife, and uh, so we 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 she lived in Britain with me for the years through my through the university years, and then in uh, 1979, uh, we saw a job advertised by the uh, Atomic Energy of Canada, Limited in uh, in Ottawa, who were trying to market PET scanners. Okay. And, uh, in retrospect, they got it wrong. Pet, they thought that PET scanners would, would be a huge market in 79. And I think, <laughs> they, I think they sold three PET scanners. Because they, they thought that this would be the same market as uh, radio, radiotherapy, Cobalt 60 radiotherapy machines, yeah. which uh, uh, Atomic Energy of Canada was the, is the largest uh, world producer of those radiotherapy machines. And they thought that the diagnostic yeah. market would be of the same size. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> and I, I spent uh, five years uh, uh, traveling backwards and forwards between Ottawa and the Montreal Neurological Institute doing suitcase physics as we tried to take the prototype that was built at the MNI and, and turn it into commercial inventions. And that was five years uh, where I got to know the MNI and the people at the MNI and then the then director of the MNI, uh, Bill Feindel, a, a, a legendary Renaissance man, uh, simply said, uh, this is stupid, come to Montreal, come to the MNI. And in those days, there were no such things as, as uh, search committees and uh, job talks and uh, the whole bureaucracy of hiring. If, the, yeah. if Bill Feindel said, come, <laughs> and, I, and I came to the MNI in 1984 to work on the, the PET program. And, and so you probably had, did you have one of the PET scanners from, uh, that was atomic made energy. From, Okay, Atomic Energy, okay. Well, uh, yeah, yes, we had, we had uh, one of the uh, prototypes from the 
from Atomic Energy, commercial one called the Theroscan. And uh, that was, as I said, a commercialized version of the Positome 3, which was the first bismuth germinate PET scanner in development that was uh, built by uh, uh, Dr. Chris Thompson, who okay. is a, a, a Heath Robinson, Rube Goldberg type of uh, physicist who could make anything uh, work. And he uh, famously built uh, the Positome 3 was, uh, was suspended on springs gigantic springs <laughs> and uh, he wanted to precess the the scanner so that it uh, filled in the sampling gaps oh my gosh detectors. oh my god <laughs> the detectors were that thick and they had to be moved like this yes well, in, a, in a sphere in a sorry in a circle that has to be has to do this yeah so, so he suspended he suspended the the entire scanner uh ring on these gigantic springs and then drove them with a windshield wiper motor to make sure to drive the procession and you could do that because most of the weight was taken by these huge industrial yes. schools. yeah yeah so it was that was the environment that i came into uh very much uh an engineering rube goldberg kind of in my environment and uh and the theroscan our commercial machine was essentially supposed to be a cleaned up and tidied up version yeah. of that so i came to the mni in 1984. okay and uh, it was a it was a very interesting time because uh, this was when PET was really beginning to, to take off. Um, but I think it's fair to say that um, PET at that time was a, a solution looking for a problem. Yeah. yeah. And it turns out that uh, at, at the MNI, we had uh, obviously a large history in cognitive neuroscience uh, at the time known as neuropsychology, yes. initiated by Brenda Milner and people like Robert Satori. Uh, were there, and yeah. they were a, a problem looking for a solution in the sense that um, uh, most of the studies of cognitive neuroscience at that time were done by invasive uh, studies of people with accidents, yeah. uh, yeah. surgical cases, or or using sodium amytal to, to freeze one side of the brain. Okay. And okay. PET came along, and PET uh, gave them the opportunity to explore the living human brain in a, in a non-invasive way. Yeah, yeah, and um, that so the, the the cognitive neuroscience and brain imaging found each other, and it was a perfect marriage, and that started in you know, 1990, 86. Right. So, and there were only like about a handful of PET scanners, like uh, Wash U had one. The uh, people in uh, Northern Europe, uh, who was it in Copenhagen? I guess uh, Albert Getty. La I guess that was, was that was Lars Ericsson and oh. and the Karol the Karolinska group. Karolinska. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, NIH, I think, had a PET scanners. I remember Jim Haxby's and Leslie yeah. Andleider had yeah, some access those, to that. Uh, Rodney Brooks. Yes, yes. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, it's, it, it is, I mean, just still thinking about why PET didn't catch on as well as therapeutic, but obviously it's, you know, creating the isotopes and uh, it was expensive. You need a cyclotron and, and all kinds of things like that. So it's like the added cost, I guess. Um, but it's interesting, too. What about, I mean, I think... Obviously, EEG still existed. Uh, I mean, existed as well. As yeah, used. EEG was established in the in North America and at the MNI by Herbert Jasper. Okay. Okay. It was started in Europe by uh, Hans Berger, but uh, uh, Jasper uh, really popularized it in North America in the forties at the MNI. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I think that's yeah, and I do remember you know being in high school and. Uh, yeah, that was the 80s, and I remember seeing a Scientific American article on, on PET scans of reading and, you know, listening and things like that. I think it was uh, uh, from the WashU group, but still. Um, but that's okay. So then, so you became the person sort of in charge of that, um, and it was mostly in the, it was mostly used for brain mapping as opposed to, you know, I guess they didn't have ligands as developed. No, as well. no, I, I wouldn't say that. Uh, when when I I came uh, in 84, and then Albert Getty came as director of the Brain Imaging Center in, I think, 85. Okay. And uh, Albert, of course, was very interested in, uh, in ligands and, and neuroreceptors, as, as well as metabolism. So yeah. he had two roles. And um, so Albert uh, really brought uh, triple integrals to the MNI with all of his uh, modeling uh, mathematical modeling, and uh, and uh, I learned a lot from Albert during during that time. 
Yeah. And uh, I think that um, I was more involved in the, the bringing of, of brain mapping to the MNI, uh, functional activation with, with PET studies. So Albert was more uh, doing the ligands and the neuroreceptors transmitters, okay. and I was doing more the brain uh, okay. uh, blood flow based brain mapping. Okay. Okay. All right. And then things grew. I mean, I think that uh, the MNI, you know, obviously now is now one of the very small handful of main groups that do brain mapping of all types. And, mm -hmm. and it was in a big part because of yourself and obviously other people, uh, other luminaries there. But, um, and so that grew and, you know, just sort of thinking back, that was about the, the time when, you know, I, I, I remember I just was reading a, a tribute to Keith Worsley you know, who's developing a lot of the processing methods, starting with PET and then for with MRI. And, uh, you know, it just occurred to me that both Keith Worsley and, and Sean Merritt, who you worked with, uh, you know, both passed away. And that was about the time that they were all maybe a little bit late 80s. Uh, yeah, that's right. I, I, well, I hired uh, Sean in 1985. Um, uh, I arrived in late 84. And the first person I hired at the MNI was Sean Merritt. Wow. Uh, uh, how lucky can you get? Yeah. But uh, Sean, he was hired as a systems manager and uh, but quickly demonstrated that he had all kinds of uh, skills. I mean, it's a polymath. He could talk to you about anything. Yes. And uh, he quickly became an all-purpose problem solver that far beyond his initial remit. Mm -hmm. And uh, he ultimately did a PhD with, uh, with Albert. Um, <laughs> which took him a long time yeah. to finally write out. I did a, did a postdoc with Roger Tutel in in Boston um, uh, before before he actually finished his PhD. It took him well, a long time to write. Well, actually, actually, uh, when I was hiring him after his postdoc, the one thing that held us up is that he had to get the documentation for his PhD. <laughs> so it took a little while but well, regardless was, of that <laughs> well this was shown he he yeah. would help anybody do anything he was a, a wonderful colleague and uh, he could critique anything that i wrote perfectly uh, and i would point out all the flaws and the weaknesses but to get him to write and <laughs> was, was a, a hell of a job because he, he was he could see all the flaws in his own work and yeah. he was almost paralyzed because he was he was just knew too much is yeah. the fundamental problem. Yeah. So, I, you know, he became your second in command, and uh, you know more than I do about the, the, the NIH years, but uh, yeah. how, how highly you regarded uh, Sean. Yeah, Sean, I mean, you know, it was interesting too, because it was mostly, I mean, there's every once in a while you, you, you work, you have the opportunity to work with really special people. And, and I, I think the key thing with Sean is that, you know, he had many skills, he was great at assessing things, but I think one thing that came across that actually uh, is, I think, important to the whole field of brain mapping is, is this human side. Uh, he really cared. He really, he really was invested, and he cared about the people, and he cared about the work. And and a lot of times that that uh, you know, that's sort of I think that true feeling, that that sincere uh, attitude, is rare, and uh, that's inspiring as well. So, so uh, to come back to that that uh, chronology. So yeah. Sean and I, and uh, Sean, if you like, Sean's replacement as system manager, as Sean became more of a scientist, uh, Peter Nealon, okay. uh, we uh, came across uh, this, uh, this crazy mathematician, statistician running around um, McGill campus, who, uh, Keith Worsley, who yeah. we found out uh, the biggest problem that statisticians have is data. <laughs> and... Uh, Keith uh, had, was actually running around the McGill quadrangle, digitizing the points on maple leaves <laughs> with the intention of, of mapping the mean maple leaf structure and the variation on maple leaf structure, just a, a set of points uh, of, awesome. the, of the leaf. Yes. <laughs> and essentially, <laughs> we said, Keith, that. That's stupid. <laughs> come, <laughs> come to the brain imaging center. We'll give you all kinds of data that we don't know how to analyze. And so uh, that started uh, uh, just a wonderful phase of our lives, uh, professional lives. The four of us, Peter, uh, Sean, myself, and Keith, it, sitting in a room uh, where clearly 
Keith was the mathematician, but he didn't know one end of the brain from the other. So yeah. you know, we had to sit, set, situate everything in context and bring yeah. the, the realistic problems. And then we just brainstorm around this. Yeah. yeah. And the four of us would sit uh, once a week in an airless room with no windows, what we called the bunker. And we just took, this went on for years. And, yeah. uh, and I, I think you're well aware of, of Keith Worsley's legacy that he brought to the field of, of, of uh, brain mapping and uh, just a wonderful, absolutely wonderful colleague and personality. Yeah. Yeah. No, Keith would, you know, I interacted with him mostly through NeuroImage. Uh, he was the section editor. I actually took over for his section editor job when, when he passed away. And, and uh, yeah, I just remember him being, you know, he was a, uh, his his mathematical skills and what he did was uh, intimidating, but he as a person was you know extremely approachable and very uh, easygoing and, and friendly. Um, we were all involved, of course, in the, the papers that that you know that published in in your image or journal of cellular blood flow metabolism, all of those papers, and we thought we were hanging on by our fingernails to to understand the complexity of those papers. Yeah. And then we found out that P P Keith was actually writing papers for the Journal of the American Statistical Association, which were 60 pages long, full of triple <laughs> integrals. And, and uh, I, think, I think I could understand the words the and but in these <laughs> papers. It was just a, just a blizzard of mathematical formalism. Uh, yeah. That was what Keith was writing to his own community. Huh. <laughs> and he was just dabbling in the brain mapping. Yeah, yeah, he was the, just he was yeah. just talking down to us. Yeah, you know, I wonder. Actually, now it occurred to me. I just I wonder what he would think of things today. I mean, things have evolved pretty much since since he passed away, and and I think that we're sort of revisiting kind of some of these problems of individual differences and and really trying to get a handle on the structural and functional differences as we try to normalize and put things in templates. And, and oh, uh, yeah. Keith would have uh, would have had a ball. He he did write a couple of papers on the early days of connectomics, but this was this was in the '90s, so this was before connectomics had really taken hold. Uh, yeah, I would I, roughly speaking, I would say that uh, connectomics really took hold in the two thousands. Yeah, but Keith was in his heyday uh, in in the late '90s. Yeah, so he wrote a couple yeah. of papers on uh, connectomics, but uh, he would have had a all with uh, how we think about connectomics and uh, neural neural masses, uh, neural neural dynamics, and as well as uh, neural uh, connectionist modeling. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think actually, and and you're right. I think that he's not only rigorous, but I think he had a sense of you know he had sort of like a a creative you know he he wasn't afraid to sort of innovate uh, you know endlessly in terms of of new ideas, and I think. Yeah, the field needs more of that. I think uh, it, you know it needs more people like Keith. That one of the, the one of the things that came out of, of that work, um, which I don't know that we've ever fully resolved, um, is the the whole question of scale. Yep. In the sense that um, if you don't know the spatial extent of the signal you're trying to detect, then you don't know what blurring kernel, what smoothing kernel you should be using, you, you know, we, we talk about Huff transforms and these things, which was, if I know how big it is, that's, that's the blurring kernel I would use. Yes. If you don't know, then you, you don't know which is the right smoothing kernel you should use. Um, so you have the classic uh, uh, trade off between resolution and, and noise. And um, formally, you should uh, explore across not just X, Y, Z, and T, but you should also explore across scale. All yeah. the data that is published should be smoothed at 20 different scales, uh, blurring kernels. Yeah. And yeah. then, you had, of course, the first, your first reaction would be, well, that will blow up the, uh, the, the uh, statistics. Uh, you, you'd have to have a whole new dimension. In fact, the paper was published uh, by uh, Lu Zhao, which, ex which explored this with, with uh, Keith Worsley, showed that the, the penalty you pay for exploring across scale space as well isn't as bad as you, you think it might be. There's a, the, the Euler uh, uh, equations, uh, essentially there's an asymptote. So it, yeah. does, it, it yeah. is not as bad as you think it would, would be. But realistically, who explores data across all possible scales as well? So every right. paper that's published in your image or human brain mapping 
they all, almost always choose some scale and it's yeah. down at the bottom of the method section. Yeah. Yes. And yes. in theory, uh, any reviewer could say, well, what if you, what if you'd taken a different scale? What would, how, what would your results look like if you learned yeah. a different kernel? And you'll get different results for sure. You'll get different structure will appear in, yes. the, in the image. So strictly speaking, you should explore across all of those scales if you don't know the size of the object you're seeking to. Yeah. Because nobody, nobody can do that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Everyone, point. right. Everyone either tries to go to high scale and that's smooth, but obviously when you have to normalize, you have to smooth to some degree. But, but I think that you're right. I think that exploring across scale gives an insight as to what the most informative scale might be. I mean, it would give a, you know, sort of a sense of, of, of the useful scale, which is, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I I totally agree with you um, with regard to that. I, and and even you know slightly shifted perspective of that. And I, I think of scale also differently. I think um, you know I just I I usually just do you know when we do subjects we don't we don't normalize we don't put it into templates because we do each one subject at a time and we just try to image at the highest resolution possible and we might smooth in some direction. Um, but like you said, with some assumptions, like with layers, we smooth along the along the layer as opposed to you know across the uh, the layers uh but i mean the the question is and i was going to jump into this a little bit later but this is a this is a perfect place to jump into this is um i always struggle with the idea of you know are we looking you know with fmri with brain mapping you know we're we're, we're mapping functional correlates of behavior or perception or whatever at at a scale of you know anywhere from one millimeter or less than a millimeter on up to maybe five millimeters. And is that, is, I mean, since the brain is organized across scales, is that, is that necessarily uh, the most, you know, the scale that has the most information? Uh, is that a scale that might explain mechanisms or is mechanisms still always, you know, beneath scale? We really want to understand, you know, how the brain is computing and that's maybe at the neural scale, maybe it's at the layer scale uh. well <laughs> there will be different structures yeah uh, real structures that appear at different spatial scales yes I think as we 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 are we are moving away from uh ball and spoke connection as models towards yes. uh well certainly now every node is unique in the sense that um uh, if you look at the chemo architecture of each of each graph theoretical node that they're, they're all different yeah. they have different receptor uh, densities and so on so uh, it becomes that much more complex than a simple ball and spoke connectionist model but yeah. you have to start somewhere yep this is the uh, uh reminds me of the long long running uh <laughs> fake fights that uh carl zillis and i used to have when we, we the the uh the uh neuroanatomy um, teaching course at OHBM because I would uh, start uh, making the point that um, the uh, functional neuroanatomical regions as defined by Brodman or von Economel and so on were based on somebody's observation of the cell three cellular characteristics and they divide the brain up into 50 odd regions based on that alone and of course yes. uh, I would argue as a physicist well, that's because you chose those three characteristics. If I had chosen different character characteristics to, to use as my base information, receptor density and so on, I'd get a completely different map of the functional architecture, the functional atlas, fun fun functional new anatomy atlas of the brain. Yes. So um, the, the standard uh, Broadman areas are they're fine as a, as a, a simple construct to work with, but yeah. it's not the truth, and 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 uh, frankly, every node on the surface map, every node is unique. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Carl would lose his mind at that. Oh, really? <laughs> that oh, really? Okay. Well, Carl, Carl, Carl would insist that of course, uh, um, you know, area forty-five and area forty-six and area forty-four, they have unique functions, and they are legitimate areas, functional yeah. you know, anatomical areas. Uh, with specific roles, and then I, I and as a non neuroanatomist, I'm not a trained neuroanatomist, so of course uh, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I would be challenging all of that. <laughs> and, and Carl, 
Carl and I would have the, you know, it was it was it was fake fighting in in front of the audience uh, yeah. to, to essentially give the tension yep. around the point. Yes, and yes. that 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 these these regions are all heterogeneous internally, yep. and you can divide them up any which way you want, dividing depending on which criteria you use, which uh, uh, base data you use. Yes, yes. Uh, that doesn't mean to say you can't build an awful lot of uh, neuroscience based on those solid brain regions, but there's nothing magic. And of course, Matt Glasser will give us 200 regions instead of instead of uh, 50, and Von Economor gives us 100. So yes, yes. Limit in the limit, every node is unique. Yeah. And um, I think it's fair to say now that as we have more and more computational resources available to us, we can now start to think about uh, how we can explore that multidimensional information yeah. and, 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 uh, and, and be comfortable with the notion that there are no specific functional areas which do one thing. Yes, yes, yeah. They're, they're all recruited as part of a network to subserve some particular function in a dynamic and remodelable fashion. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it, it was okay to say to say such things, but uh, they, uh, twenty years ago we didn't have the wherewithal to actually analyze such data. Well, now we do. Yeah. So we're yeah. going to see more and more and more machine learning approaches that are, mm -hmm. are going to take all of this data and beat it to death and and come out with. Well, I, I used to criticize AI for being essentially a glorified pattern recognition engine. Um, without any interpretation, well, yeah. that's no longer true. Now you yeah. have you have you know generative adversarial models and and uh, variational autoencoders and all of these approaches, which are which are essentially are parameterizing the uh, the underlying providing an underlying parameterized model, yeah, with which to interpret the clusters that you find. Yes. So yeah. things are changing where it is now possible, and in fact, it will be more and more required. To take into account the heterogeneity of every point yes. on yep. the surface map, yep. um, you won't have to necessarily break it down into fifty regions that you can work with. Yeah, and I think actually right. I would like you said the fifty regions initially. I mean, early on in the very early days of like fMRI or whatever, it was like there's the visual area and then and you know motor or whatever, and then it divided in. And you know, you know, it seems that the more finely you look, the more the more diversified the functions and. And it seems that that keeps on going all the way down until you get to, you know, columns and layers, or you know, maybe at that point still, you know, maybe there's some other principle of how that's organized. But I, you know, just it, it's interesting that you mentioned machine learning too, because it seems that it we have sort of reached the limits of you know the data that we're getting. It's you know, it's you know, especially multimodal data, and we'll talk about your big big project as well, but. Um, it's so detailed, it's so multidimensional that you almost need machine learning to just capture all the dimensions and look for relationships at that high dimensional space. I mean, it seems that it's hard to do that just with your classical, even the most sophisticated an analytic techniques for doing this. So, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating time, isn't it? Because we, are, we now have the computational resources to allow us to gather all of this multimodal data and to and the analytic engines to allow us to uh, to explore that multidimensional data. It's going to throw up um, counterintuitive yeah. spatial temporal dynamics, and especially if you incorporate the scale issue that we were just talking about. Yes, yes. Um, that's going to show us new ways in which in which uh, the, the brain is organized. Yeah, and we will move beyond simple ball and spoke connection as models. We we are moving on at this point. People are now talking all the time about. Uh, Neural dynamics and uh, the, the wave particle duality yep. that Michael Breakspeare <laughs> will, uh, will tell you all about. That. Um, it's, it, it's, I'm, I'm intrigued to see how one can reconcile the, the uh, neural mass models and yes. neural dynamic field, field, neural field models. Um, they're both true. Yeah. Simultaneously, and uh, it's going to be uh, very exciting over the next ten to twenty years to see how how those those two worldviews are reconciled. Yeah. At, yes. At different scales. Yeah. Now, you, yeah. you did ask me, uh, I think, uh, in what would might be an appropriate scale, and uh, I I have this sense, you know, there are ten to the eleven neurons 
each of which have 10 to the fourth synapses on the average. So, uh, and we see oftentimes this same motif uh, re-emerging of about 10 to the fifth neurons aggregating into a cortical column or into a visual blob. Yes. Well, I'm, nature doesn't do that by accident. There's, yep. there's some underlying uh, benefit to, to organizing at the level of about 10 to the fifth mesoscopic brain. So I, I think um, operating at the mesoscopic level where you have 10 to the 11th divided by 10 to the fifth, that means 10 to the sixth units. Yes, yes. Uh, each of which have 10 to the fourth. Yeah, neurons or, or uh, connections. So connections. You, you, can, you, you can almost see a, a sparse matrix of um, yeah. 10 to the sixth. Yes, yes. And I think that that's something that we, we, we are almost at the point where computers can handle that. Yeah. And that's almost in itself kind of a principle. Like it seems that there's, you know, maybe that's a, some type of, you know, magic, not really a magic number, but sort of a number where, where information handling is, is, is somehow reaches a, a level where it can be, that's the most efficient or that's, uh, you know. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, um, how can I put this? I don't want to uh, dismiss the the uh, the, the microcircuitry. I mean, that has its own justification. Yes. But if you if if you're trying to understand how the entire brain is operating, yeah. Um, I I think you have to take some water with the wine. You have to to assume assume that these functional units, yeah, vertical columns, blobs, and so on, they they have a definable role, and can be treated as as a unit. Which and then you can operate of the whole brain mesoscopic level, and I, I, that I find to be uh, you know, really most tractable. Yeah, to understand the entire brain. So when you want to talk about the trade-off between the default mode network and the the uh, multiple domain, multi multiple demand network, how yep. the trade-off between task-based and and internal inferential, that you need to operate at the at the whole brain level. Yep. Yes. Um, the best way to do that, I think, is at the mesoscopic level, where you yeah. have something like a million units. Yes, yes. That's interesting. Okay. So along those lines, I mean, as far as that, uh, so you have a, you had a really nice paper actually talking about you know this type of thing, or in, in sort of having a an argument for for exploring the the microstructure and to understand mechanisms and and, and before I get into that though, for a second, I just I really do feel that we're kind of at a unique time in terms of modeling. Uh, it seems like we're getting slowly getting overwhelmed with data. And it seems like there's this sort of explosion in types of modeling, everything from, you know, what Danny Bassett does, like you said, with Michael Breakspear as well, and all of Sporans and, and whatnot. But it seems that there's, they're trying to gel in some sense. And, and I often think, well, will more data help it? I mean, just in, in, along the lines of, I mean, maybe it, the analogy doesn't hold, but, you know, when, when when Darwin found out the principle of natural selection, he only had a little bit of data, but he he had some insights with the data. And I wonder if, and we're sort of at that stage where we're there's the, the equivalent of a principle of natural selection that we're that's waiting to be discovered that we don't necessarily, uh, you know, this microscopic data might give the essential clues. Uh, but anyway, this my rambling on on the interaction of models and principles and and data. Uh, well, yeah, I, I think that um, first of all, I, I don't believe in in the uh, proposed co conflict between hypothesis-driven research and big data yes. fishing. Yeah, I, you you can take the data and you split it into and, and generate and use it uh, a non-hypothesis-driven exploration yes. that will generate new ideas and new hypotheses and then you can use the other half of the data to test those hypotheses yes so what, yes. The, the idea that uh, big data analytics is somehow an, the antithesis of classical hypothesis driven research doesn't make sense to me i i completely agree in fact i even agree in a slightly different way too i think that even the act of exploring i mean exploratory you're you're still you you, you still carry with you hypotheses for making sense of what you're finding when you explore. And so it's like micro hypotheses in some sense. And then you can, you know, you back up and then you form an uh, hypothesis based on what you found. And, and you, I think that's, I agree with you. I think that, um, I think they kind of merge in some sense. Uh, 
I, I guess it'd be, uh, yeah. we couldn't finish the discussion of um, how things evolved. Um, we, I think at the end of the 90s, we, we moved, we started to realize that you could do the same sort of thing uh, with structure that you could do with function. You know, all, all of the brain mapping principles started out simple cognitive experiments and sensory motor experiments. Yes. But uh, we started to, to, to do the same sort of thing to study structure. And that gave rise to the, you know, these multi-subject probabilistic atlases. Subsequently, that followed up with uh, studies of structural covariance. And, and all of those kinds of ideas, they were essentially logical extensions of, of uh, the original brain mapping ideas based on what was functional activation with PET became yeah. functional activation with MRI, but then we started to do structural MRI. Yes. And uh, many, many new threads uh, sprung off from, from those, those uh, ideas. Yeah. I do remember uh, visiting um, uh, Bruce Rosen and in the, um, the, late, the late 90s. And uh, the, after giving a lecture, the, we had a dinner with uh, uh, Jack Bellevue yeah. and and uh, Bruce Rosen, where they started to tell me how they had this new technique that you could study uh, changes in brain cognition using MRI. And at the time, as a as a as a pet guy, I dismissed that. No, you know, no time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I had no idea who I was talking to. <laughs> this was this was the origins of functional MRI with Ken Kwong. Yes. Yeah. It was at that time. I yeah, that, that. Yeah, they, they, there was a, that was a very, very exciting time. Um, and it was, uh, right. I mean, being, I was a graduate student at the time and that, that sort of came along and I've been working, I've been working on that ever since, but, but, but it's interesting. Uh, and, and I think it's worth, uh, in, in how you set this up in terms of, uh, looking at the structure as well, but also, uh, in terms of tools. So MRI is a tool, uh, that is a tool, and you have your array of tools. And I think it seems that what you've done just from, you know, just a glance at, at what exists at the m and uh, what you've done is sort of create these uh, or organize these, these consortia and tools to really, you know, catalyze the, the research in some sense, to sort of focus it to allow better access, to allow us better standardization. Uh, and, and I don't know of any other group, uh, you know, maybe Stanford a little bit, and, and of course, you know, maybe Oxford and a few others, but, but nothing, no, no group that is, has this collection of various tools for, uh, for pooling data, for analyzing data, for comparing data, and so on. Um, how did that start? I mean, how did how did you? What was your first consortia, <laughs> or your first platform that you um, were so? I mean, and I know there was many many people involved in the whole thing, but it seems that that you helped, you know, get. Well, I I suspect that the the first uh, thing that you might call a platform was with with the uh, the tools that Keith Worsley developed for the statistical analysis of of uh, pet activation studies. Yes, turned those into into a suite of uh, of analytic tools and they made them publicly available. So I, I suspect yeah. that was the first one that I would say was a, uh, yeah. a widely adopted platform. And of course, the the M and I space in terms of normalization. Uh, yeah, well, that uh, that was I, I think an outgrowth of what I just said before, where yeah. we started to apply the same principles to structure instead of function. So then we naturally started to explore probabilistic anatomy. And around that time, of course, uh, we saw the arrival in the mid '90s of the International Consortium for Brain Mapping. Yep. That was uh, John Maziota and Arthur Toger in UCLA. Yes. Uh, yes. Peter Fox and Jack Lancaster in University of Texas, and yep. in Montreal. And uh, you know, <laughs> by way of backstory, we we all thought we could get funding from the U.S. Human Brain Project. Uh, but uh, if we pooled our resources, then we could guarantee we could get the money, and then we would fight amongst ourselves to to 
to, <laughs> to write it up. That's so, interesting. <laughs> so that's actually that's actually what we did in, wow. in, in the in the mid nineties. So that I think that was an early uh, example of consortium. Okay. And uh, I I think the ICBM uh, had a fifteen year run, maybe twenty years uh, run, and um, a, a lot of ideas sprung from the, those consortia. The idea of probabilistic atlases, for instance, was a direct. That was one of the major motivations for for getting the grant in the first place. Was was that, hmm. and that's when we were developing these probabilistic uh, structures. Okay. Okay. And I think uh, I learned a lot from, uh, particularly from John Maziotta, as as someone who who manages to organize multinational. Uh, multimodality consortia. Yes, um, I, I learned a lot from from John about I think uh, how to keep people enjoying coming together. Yeah, and I don't mean just going to nice places. I mean the whole style of the meetings were were strategic in nature rather than getting lost in the weeds. Yeah, yes, and yeah. that's that's where people like Carl Zillis and Katrin Amunds. Uh, we got to know them through ICBM, and of course, I'm working today very closely with Katrin yes. 30 years later, and the Big Brain being one of our most obvious collaborations. Yeah. And so I, I think um, you you asked about uh, the origins of consortia. Well, I think yeah. ICBM was a significant factor in that. And that's interesting about what you can do. Like you said, that uh, you know, coming up with the probabilistic atlases. That- I mean, at, with at a consortium level, at least you get the NIH's attention, I guess, or, or other funders, and uh, uh, and it gives you some space and to work together. And it gives, uh, and if you are collegial and collaborative, then then it's it's certainly it's synergistic. Perhaps to continue that thread, you asked how how did this all come about? Well, within the context of ICBM, uh, uh, we at the MNI felt the need to develop. Uh, large compute resources and that gave rise to Seabrain, which is yep. the port of the high performance computing and now and now to um, cloud cloud uh, resources so uh, I think yeah. we we wanted to bring all of that to, to in service of our multimodal brain analytics and we were starting to think about getting larger and larger n yeah. subjects you needed yep. big compute to analyze it. Because we were collecting multimodal data, behavioral as well as multimodal imaging, then we had to come up with a multimodal databasing environment. So that gave rise to Loris. And so all of those things yep. uh, were starting to come together in the late 90s. And um, the, then we got involved in many other projects, which all were sitting on top of those same platforms. Yes. So when you say it, it seems like a, a, a bewildering array of acronyms. Uh, yeah. Now, it, it, you, when you first look at it, it does. But but when you look at the evolution, it all makes sense. It all sort of hangs together. Well, it's all they're all sitting on top of Lawrence and Seabrain is, is the point. Okay. And everybody has their own particular use case. So if, if for instance, you're talking about um, uh, the MNI's uh, Bio repository, biospecimen repository for open dissemination of tissue, yeah, and and iPSCs and so on. That's that's a, a, a massive use case, but it's sitting on top of a Loris. Yes. So okay. uh, I, I think that all of these consortia that you that you are are referring to, are, they're all taking advantage of the same infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, and which is actually a a, a nice principle to bring out as well is that is that you can you know it's it's very synergistic you, where you build the infrastructure and then you have things that take advantage of the infrastructure and it just builds from there and which is much more productive than you know people trying to build a, a one-off tool that's sort of a standalone sort of thing that's not sort of plugged into this, this environment but what i see happening in some sense is that you know there's there's some parallel work there's for instance the and it's also parallel, but also syner- synergistic in some sense. Where, like Russ Poldrack's Open Neuro, is ca- has similarities to some degree uh, to 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 what you're doing. And then, but there's collaboration as well. So it's interesting to see the direction it's all kind of going. <laughs> yeah, well, so um, Seabrain is a is a you know, just a portal to high performance computing, and uh, 
you can get access to Seabrain through uh, Open Neuro. Yes, yes. Uh, that, but Seabrain has been around for 15, 20 years right. at this point. So yes. it's, it's used in, in, in lots of different uh, uh, projects. And, uh, yeah, that's wonderful. I actually, I didn't fully appreciate that uh, in how, how broadly available it is. And, and, uh, and it's interesting. I was talking a little bit uh, about this uh, uh, and, and trying to understand, you know, the, the challenge of, you know, moving large amounts of data to, you know, you can temporarily move your data to the server there to do the analysis uh, as far as that's concerned. That seems like it's still an ongoing problem of, of uh, how do you manage the large amounts of data? If you well, have... it's getting worse, not better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With the, the, the increasing uh, restrictive nature of, yep. of uh, GDPR and, and other regulatory frameworks and so on, uh, particularly in Europe. So this is antithetical to the, the whole idea of open science. Yeah. I think that's an issue that we haven't yet resolved. Yeah, I've, I've sat in conferences uh, recently where um, people have described the landscape of uh, particularly the uh, European uh, privacy and data protection laws, and they're, uh, they're essentially contradictory in, in a yeah. lot of ways. And so how do you convince people to contribute to the ethos of open science and open data sharing Yeah, uh, while you have these privacy regulations and, and regular uh, data governance oversights, which are, which are working to prevent that, that open dissemination of data. Yeah, it is. It's, a it's an unintended problem. consequence. It wasn't meant to, to restrict the kinds of science that we do. Yeah. Uh, we are essentially uh, collateral damage that um, we're still uh, in, a, in a very, very interesting uh, state of affairs right now where, where people are increasingly wanting to share data, but the regulations are becoming more restrictive. Yeah, if you could have some sort of standard of de-identification in some way that, I mean, it seems, still seems like that's still evolving. Like people are claiming you can identify a person by their gyral patterns. Okay, then... You know, there's I, I, I've, I've uh, heard that argument for the last decade, and I still haven't seen it actually put into practice. Yeah, I know in theory it, it, it could be true, like, just like a fingerprint, but uh, I have I've yet to see it actually put into practice. Yeah, so one of those boogeymen that uh, can justify right uh, overly restrictive uh, uh, data protection. Yes, in in our experience, there's a lot of open science that takes place at, at the M and I, of course, and. Uh, uh, we are constantly told by the patients that they want their data yeah. to be distributed because <laughs> they think they, the cure will come faster yep. if more people are looking at their data. So, of course, uh, they want to see the proper uh, de-identification, but uh, they are very much in support of the principles of large-scale data agglomeration, data sharing, such that you can, you can detect much more subtle signals yes. and potentially ethnic differences or, or a cultural difference, all of these things that you cannot get at with small n. Yes, yes. No, I, I completely agree. And it is, it's really, we're in interesting times because I think it is being evolving. I, I think ultimately it will be open, obviously, but it does seem like there are some steps backwards, like, like with the UK Biobank, for instance. It seems that there's something going on there that's, uh, you know, that they're now restricting access in, in some way. And I don't fully, I'm not on top of the, the entire discussion, but, yeah, but well, there is some tension. Yeah, that's a, that's a live issue for sure. I, in, in our own context, um, I, I don't know if, if uh, we really talked about the, uh, the current Healthy Brains, Healthy Lives initiative here. So I guess I should yeah. just mention what that is. Sure. Yeah, um, the Healthy Brains, Healthy Lives, uh, HBHL initiative is, is um, a relatively large uh, program uh, mechanism on the order of $100 million. And it's uh, supposed to uh, explore the relationship between big data, uh, advanced analytic strategies like AI and so on, applied to multimodal data uh, to support a, 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 a significant number of uh, themes. And yes. sub themes. So neurodevelopment, neurodegeneration, neuroplasticity. All of these are, are built on top of a substantial investment in infrastructure, including things like Loris and Seabrain. So we've built all of that. And it's spent a lot of money building that. Yes. And um, 
this has to serve uh, approximately 250 PIs at McGill and approximately a thousand uh, highly qualified personnel. So you, it's, it's an extensive wow. in, environment that you had built. Yes. And one of the, one of the uh, I think, jewels in the crown of that whole setup was uh, access to the UK Biobank. And we are eternally grateful to the UK Biobank I mean, for, for making this wonderful resource available to the community. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we approached them, I guess, uh, four years ago now to uh, essentially request not a, not a hypothesis-driven subset of the data. We asked, can we have all the data? And then we'll worry about disseminating it to our community of literally over 200 PIs. Yes. And uh, they, I think, uh, understood that the popularity of the UK Biobank was such that um, handling all the literally thousands of people, uh, researchers out there who wanted access to a subset of the UK Biobank data was not, it wasn't going to scale. Yes. So yeah. when we approached them and they said, uh, please give us all the data and we'll take care of local dissemination <laughs> so you don't have 200 incompatible subsets of the data. Yes. They agreed to that. So we, we built a large infra infrastructure to support this. I think uh, HBHL has, has uh, done very well using the UK Biobank. We're very eternally grateful for getting access. Yes. But now, they, now there's, as you know, a serious ferment in the field yeah. as they uh, now are just, uh, concerned about data privacy, data security, and they, they want to retr essentially retrench into uh, a single point of access, the research access protocol. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I don't know how this is going to work. Um, That's interesting. So they basically will restrict you from distributing it, and and or well, there there that. are there are um, opportunities for exemptions. Okay. And mm -hmm. it, it it it's yet to be seen uh, yeah. exactly how broad the yeah. ex exemption net stretches yeah, yeah. Um, so and it, it's it's hard to, to to say how it will fall out but this is essentially a, a consequence of the concerns about data security data yeah. privacy and on all of these things yes. so um open science is is very much the future uh, for reasons we were just talking about getting access to a, a, a unbelievably large and yeah with all of the heterogene heterogeneity that it involves this is a natural for machine learning approaches right right exactly so I mean, it, obviously yeah. that's where the field is going to go yes um there, there will be some bumps in the road as we try and work out this trade-off between privacy and security and and um, um access yes, open yes. Science. and it's a it's very much a moving target yeah yeah I, as a matter of fact right with machine learning i you know people wonder ask me why machine learning isn't applied more to fmri and i i, I usually try to say well it, it just needs more data, more learning data uh, to, you know, eventually it will, it will be applied more, but, and this is perfect for that. And one of the most uh, uh, energetic projects that we have going right now is, is uh, the Global Brain Consortium. Um, and that is essentially uh, addressing the, uh, the premise that low and middle income countries have data Usually in the past, their data has been uh, taken up by a Western laboratory. Research has been done with that data and publications uh, come out in the usual, in the usual journals. Yes. But the, the people who provided the data in the first place are bystanders often to the process. Yeah. Uh, the whole point of the Global Brain Consortium is to make uh, the tools and analytics available to those yeah. scientists, such they can ask the questions themselves, either of their own data or indeed of open science data anywhere. Yes. And they can then fully participate in the research enterprise, yeah. not, not as bystanders, but they can drive their own questions. Yeah. So that's where things like Seabrain come in. You can, you can endow people pretty much anywhere with access to large scale compute. Yes. Yeah. And uh, they don't have to worry about lo local resources. Yeah. And that's that's a, an amazing right. I mean, so the being able to distribute this to to people just simply as a web browser online, and and having these powerful tools at their fingertips. Do you worry a little bit with um, 
you know, I, I, I think about this, you know, you always think about tensions and trade-offs and uh, as, as tools become more available and more standardized, um, you know, you wonder if it might uh, suppress in some sense. I always worry about whether it might, you know, people will naturally gravitate to using those more, but there's many, there's, there's a whole space of, you know, innovation in tools that, that might, uh, you know, that, that will still go on, but will it go on at the same rate as if, you know, I wonder if there's a tension between the innovation of tools versus standardized tools. And um, I, I don't think so, um, as long as everything is done with sunlight. Yeah. Okay. If, if everybody's using this particular tool and someone else can essentially take those same data and analyze them with a different tool and point out that sunlight, yeah. then... Yeah. then People yeah. will vote with their feet if it is demonstrated uh, with proper methods that method B is better than method A. So I, 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 I can see why uh, there might be a concern that people will just use the one that's got the most PR or the most, most popular. Yeah. But science is self-correcting and it will ultimately say, you know, there's a better way of doing this. And false results will ultimately be shown to be false yes maybe not not immediately but you know in in, in due course with open science and sunlight then then the right answer will finally be arrived at yeah uh, I, 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 I i do understand the concern but i, I think it, there's a, a natural self-correcting mechanism with open science i think i think you're right and i and i do think that and so a lot of the lines of open science and and big data um you know at ohbm you know, I, I've noticed that more and more people are, you know, more students, postdocs are just analyzing big data, which I think is a great thing because it's, it's, that's it being used. Uh, there's some scientists who believe that not all the answers are in big data, which they're probably right. But um, uh, at the same time, what do you think of the fact that maybe I would say at least half now have never collected data on their own? Um, you know, there's a trade-off there too. It's like there's something about having a visceral feel for how the data are collected to think about the experiment uh, versus just simply doing data science on, on data. Well, I, I mean, I, I, as we discussed earlier, I, I, I'm loath to put the, the big data and hypothesis-driven smaller projects in opposition. I, I don't think they are in conflict. Okay, okay, yeah. However, um, we, we are always going to need new data. We're always going to new, need uh, just proper representation, representative data sets and yeah. uh, uh, more multimodal data. We're always going to need more of that. You're going to need UK biobanks yeah. at, at yeah. larger and larger scale. Um, so the, there have to be uh, mechanisms where, where the funding for such projects come. The UK Biobank was a long time in gestation. George Radda, who just recently passed away um, in the UK, who was a, a great, great proponent of this, this idea, and it took 10, 15 years yes. to finally come to fruition. And look at the benefits to all of us. Yes. In an earlier time, look at ADNI. There's yeah. so many ways you can criticize these data sets that are not being representative and it's a, Vast amounts of science came from ADNI. Yes. Yes. Right? And vast amounts of science are coming from the UK Biobank. So yeah. I, I think the idea of large scale data sets that uh, can be analyzed by everybody is a good thing. Yeah. However, we are always going to need new large data sets. So th there's a, that's where you, I would like to see a situation where. Uh, the, the funding agencies of different countries come together and work together to fund large scale data acquisition projects, which will seed much analysis in the way that we are seeing today. Yes. The, yeah. the, the, it, it has been demonstrated that this works. Yes. And it's yeah. at the UK Biobank. So that model and then making that available works. Yeah. Um, but I think. Um, there is a risk, as, as you're intimating, that uh, we'll all, all end up building our careers on existing data sets without collecting new ones. So there is a risk. We do, we do need an international uh, initiative to collect the next level of big data, which is global. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you. I agree that, that the data could be everything from wearables to 
you know, uh, other sort of behavioral data to, you know, potentially uh, it could be, it could also coalesce to something like the super collider uh, things with, you know, with physics and that yes. you might have like one center where there's a massive scanner that's uh, all the money is put into super high field or something. That's a, that's an excellent analogy. That's, that's exactly where we're, we're ultimately going to go. And that's what happens when you let physicists into brain research. <laughs> It gets bigger and bigger. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, so uh, I, I know we're, we're, we're probably coming short on time, but at the same time, I just wanted to also briefly discuss, you know, when I visited your, your lab, you, you showed me the, the big brain. And uh, I was blown away by that data just because of the detail and uh, the multimodal you know, aspect of it. And and one sense when looking at this data set, so you can describe it, but uh, basically it's, you know, uh, human data that's scanned in, it's stained, and it's uh, incredibly detailed. Um, one sense that you get is that there's a lot to be discovered. Just, you know, you could just look at it and, and you just can't wait for the tools to sort of uh, draw the connections between what you see and, and what you see with functional MRI or behavior or whatever. Um, yeah. And I, and maybe if you just describe that and also what is the hope for this data set, you know, in terms of, you know, along the lines of what we were discussing before, sort of drawing this connection across scale of, of maybe trying to get at mechanisms or trying to get at principles by how like, you know, certain or, neurons are organized for processing certain information that then can lead up to, functional MRI data or whatever that can explain it better. Um, yeah. So the, I guess a couple of comments, uh, just first of all, just context, what is the big brain? Well, yeah. it's, it's um, the data itself is, it was a, a macrocriotone data section in Yulish by, by Carl Zillis and then Katrin Amunds. Yes. Yeah. And uh, 7,404 sections, 20 microns thick, and uh, originally 10 microns in plane resolu resolution. My group, uh, particularly uh, a research uh, associate in the lab, Claude Lepage, spent years dealing with uh, lots of artifactual issues, which you obviously are going to get um, with, with such very, very thin data across the whole brain. Yes, yeah. Um, so yeah. He, spent, he spent years uh, building the infrastructure and computational analysis to integrate all of this data into a, a holistic uh, three-dimensional object. We published it in 2013. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, um, approximately 25,000 downloads of that data in the first couple of years, but not a lot of papers. And a, hmm. I think a lot, a lot of it was because there were the computational resources to handle this beast. Yes. And yes. then if you fast forward perhaps five years to about 2018, there's been a very uh, sharp increase in the number of publications coming out of that. And I think it boils down to people have the uh, computational resources to work with this. Yeah, stuff. yes. And uh, yeah, lots of people like to, to uh, play with it, but uh, you know, visualize it. It's yeah. Like, get the popcorn out and <laughs> get in front of the screen. Yeah. But, but there's, there's, there's increasingly uh, lots of papers coming out now. And uh, I, I think particularly the papers that show the cortical layer structure, Conrad Wagstill's work, and yeah. uh, the, the work that Boris Bernhardt and Casey Bacola and uh, their, their group have done in terms of uh, uh, neural gradients, uh, yeah. uh, architectural gradients. This is, this is stuff that's... Um, there's just a growing wealth of results coming out of that, quite yeah. apart from the usual segmentation of this structure and that subnucleus right. with many, many papers of that form. Um, where it's going, I, we are in the midst of collecting a one micron thick data, it's optical data. You can't, you can't slice, you can't section at one micron, of course, over yeah. the whole brain. So right. it, it, these are optical. These are optical uh, uh, confocal microscopic slicing of uh, within the twenty micron section. So, oh, okay. okay, and then you can of course do, do one micron in plane. Yes. So the uh, long term goal, still very much in in uh, gestation, is a one by one by one micron data set. Uh, that's going to take a while. Um, we we do not have the computational resources to handle that yet. Just. I guess some simple numbers. Uh, uh, 
20 microns is, is um, 50 times smaller than a millimeter. So the big brain as it is today is 50 times 50 times 50 times smaller, a voxel. So that means it's uh, 50 times 50 times 50 times larger than an MRI volume at one millimeter. Yes. Yeah. It's... So that means it's the equivalent of, of 125,000 MRIs or, yeah. 100, or 100 adneys. Yeah. That's the yeah. big brain today. If you, if you take it further and you go down to, um, it's, it's about a petabyte. Uh, sorry, a terabyte, my mistake. If you go down from 20 microns down to one micron isotropic, that's 20 times, 20 <laughs> times, 20 <laughs> times. So that's 8,000 terabytes. Yeah. Eight, eight petabytes in yeah. one data set. So clearly we're not going to be able to manipulate that anytime soon. Right. Uh, but right. it's that's one of the things that we are working towards is, yeah. is to handle a one micron isotropic whole brain. Right. You were mentioning like working with Google, like, you know, Google Earth seems like it has yeah. a similar problem. And it's like, and it's, that's what it is. Yeah. That's what yeah. it is. And you, you have no doubt seen the recent papers coming out where they're, they're producing you know, fly brain, uh, whole, whole brain. Yes. Yeah. yes. Well, we'd like to do that for the human brain. It'll yeah. take a while. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting that now we're still up against, uh, you know, we collect this data, we're still up against the computational and, and memory. And, well, that's, yeah. it's, an, it's never going to change. It's all, it, you're always at the bleeding edge of what technology you can deliver. And what I described as the evolution of being able to mani manipulate the big brain. Yeah. It's yeah. going to be the same with these data sets. Uh, we'll, we will, in 10 years' time, we will laugh at the, the technical limitations yeah. that we have today. Right. So you have to just have enough vision to see that, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with the compute. Yeah. That will, yeah. that will go away. What will not go away is the conceptual vision that you've built and what you're right. trying to achieve. So I, I, I have to make proper uh, uh, deference to uh, the Eulish people because the it's not just the histology uh, uh, um, people like uh, Marcus Axer they developed the polarized light imaging yeah which is look, spectacular. look at the right matter connectivity uh, with uh, directions they're doing it right now in sections of a piece of the hippocampus a piece of the cortex and so on it won't be very long in the next few years where you will have that for the whole brain you know, the sky is the limit when you have all of that kind of, of um, connectivity information associated with the chemo architecture, yeah, yeah. and the and the uh, you know, the usual histology. Uh, one of the things that uh, is worth mentioning again in this context, and that's what Highball was all about. It's big brain and friends. Yeah. So that then you take the chemo architecture that uh, Carl Zillis built for so long. Um, which were originally 2D plates. We all attended OHBM conferences and, and, and marveled at the beauty of, of those, those uh, autoradiography yes. data sets that Carl would show. Yeah. We would, those were 2D. Yeah. And in the, in the last few years, uh, we've built uh, particularly um, uh, Thomas Funk, who is a student in my lab and is now uh, at the Child Mind Institute uh, with uh, Mike Milham. Yeah. Uh, Thomas built uh, 3D maps, took, took, took those 2D, 2D autoradiography data sets and, and, and uh, essentially reworked them into 3D, dealing yeah. with a, a lot of artifactual and methodological issues, which yeah. uh, I won't bore you with, but uh, it took a, if it was easy, it would have been done years ago. Right, uh, right, Thomas right. Uh, did that, and now we have essentially the basis for 3D autoradiography maps over the whole brain. Yeah. So now you can incorporate chemo architecture, PLI, connectivity, and histology under yeah. under one roof. So then you can start to ask these questions that we were talking about at the beginning of this discussion about how can we uh, divide up the brain. Well, yeah. it'll, it it won't be just uh, the, the the local properties. It will also include the connectivity properties. Yes. 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 And, and connectivity, right, at, at, at you know, across microscales, connectivity of units across larger scales, and to try to get a sense of that. And, and that's actually the, you know, the question that's most on my mind is that, that there might be, 
lot of information that's immediately available that's highly informative and and I guess the idea is that you explore it, but then you you have a model for you know you you have to sort of refine your models of you know or hypotheses of you can you know that's this is once again the question of exploration versus hypotheses is that uh, the exploration part is important to do, but at the same time it seems like it has to iterate with the models in some sense and you uh, and the goal you know and then brings to mind what's the what's the What's the goal with this? Is there an hypothesis that's sort of waiting for this scale of information to, to be answered? So, for instance, um, or or is it simply at the scale? Then you can sort of help form models of of what's going on and and you know trying to then get derived principles of how the, how the brain works. And, and so there is this tension. Like you know, people get excited about the data because intuitive they feel that. That there's information there that will inform their understanding of the brain, uh, which is true. It's but it's more than just the facts. It's more like okay, we're going to answer questions about how it all, how it actually how it actually works. <laughs> so and, and then yeah, once again, it's this balance between the hypothesis and and the exploration that you need them both. Well, you know, there there are lots of models out there, and Stan DeHane or Paul Christen and the Mark Rubin random fields, and all all of these models uh, uh, try to, to explain how the, the brain actually functions in, in real time. It's a reinforcement learning mechanism. I see a, a lot of, of uh, information coming into our field from the AI world. Uh, people like Blake Richards, uh, as an example, is doing um, uh, uh, brain-like machine learning. Right, right now, most uh, machine learning approaches still have a lot of layers and a lot of nodes and yep. uh, some sort of pattern recognition drops out the, out the bottom. That is not a brain model. Right. Or back so, propagation, for instance. Right. So, yeah. so, so, so the, the uh, uh, brain-inspired machine learning, I think, is, is uh, very exciting. Yeah. Uh, and the work yeah. that people like uh, Blake Richards are, are, are doing to look at using uh, brain-inspired artificial intelligence, that's going to be, I think, in a very exciting uh, model-based approach to to uh, uh, artificial intelligence, and I think we'll see a lot more of that in the next decade. Even in Montreal, is he in Montreal? Uh, Yoshi Bengio or uh, Yoshua um... Bengio um, is at the University of Montreal, not okay. Okay. And uh, Yoshua is one of the three people who established machine learning. Jeff Hinton just got the Nobel Prize. Yes, yes, yeah. And then Yann LeCun, the uh, are the three people who uh, are. Uh, Recognized as having established re-establishing deep learning, yeah. uh, machine learning in, in general, and then deep learning because um, it was uh, for a time during the '90s it was losing losing favor, and then they re-established it, yes. relaunched it, and uh, now it's as you well know everywhere. Yeah, and uh, obviously this is once once again with the computational level of uh, you know finally caught up because it, now you can actually have enough compute power to do it, but. Uh, um, but yeah, no, it seems like you would have a lot of potential collaborations with him. Oh yeah, well, they're, they're, I mentioned uh, Blake Richards as as one example. Uh, we have a lot of people who are professors at McGill who are also part of uh, MILA, the Machine the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms. Yeah, and that's where uh, it's run by Joshua Benjio. So uh, there's a, there's a, an excellent uh, milieu of neuroscience and um, machine learning, deep learning. In, okay. in Montreal, and obviously the challenge is to put these two universes together. Okay. okay. So, you know, many projects which are going on at that level. Uh, yeah. Some of those within the HBHL that I talked about. Yes. Uh, yes. But there are many, many independent initiatives. It, it's an exciting time to, to be in yeah. Montreal for sure. That's really exciting. That's that's yeah, that's amazing. So, uh, okay. So you know, obviously we can talk for many hours, I'm sure, but uh, just to try to wrap it up. Maybe two questions in general, and, and we have already sort of hit on one. But uh, uh, you know, one, what most excites you about uh, what's going on, and and as far as the future is concerned, with any specific project, and uh, and you know, also, is there any advice that uh, you might give to young researchers starting out? What skills they need to learn? What are what's important uh, as far as you know, the skills to develop? Uh, what questions to ask? Things like that. Well, I think when it when it comes to to science, I'm I'm 
I'm jealous <laughs> that I'm at the end of my, my career. And uh, what I see happening right now is so exciting. Um, uh, data science is, is coming of age. It's becoming mature and, and more directed towards biological questions. Yes. And we have to see yet the, uh, the impact in the clinical research, clinical management context. That's, that's going to take a while. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I always make the, the uh, cliche that what we're trying to build here within HBHL is, is essentially the Star Trek tricorder. <laughs> yeah. Such yeah. that it's delivered to the, the uh, clinician yes. at the bedside, all of this big data. Well, yeah. we're at the foothills of, of that vision. Yeah. That's where I, I, I see we're inevitably going as all of these uh, elements that we've talked about today are brought to bear. I don't see anything stopping that continuous evolution. Yeah. So okay. that's what's going to happen. And I wish I was going to be around to, to watch all of this happen over the next 10, 20 years. Well, you, you never know. Well, yeah, I, I could I could try and pretend and do what Brenda Milner does. Is, yeah. You know, <laughs> Brenda's uh, still going strong, doing very, very well at 106. Yeah. So oh, my gosh. We, we could all, we could all uh, aspire to, to that. That is incredible. Um, but in terms of uh, advice, be curious. Yeah. Uh, and, in, and, and, and I think enjoy, enjoy other people's success. We, we, we have often been trained, uh, you know, get your, your name on, a, on your first author paper and, and uh, in the past, jealously protect that. And, and get your your career defining paper. Well, I, I'm, I'm not saying that's wrong. There is a there is a there is a, a place for that. It's hypothesis driven research and by an individual. Yes. But I think um, uh, brain science has become so multidisciplinary, so uh, uh, broad, industrial strength brain research that you yeah. cannot be an expert in everything. So you have to be able to talk to different types of people. Yes. And you have to. How can I put it? Uh, enjoy their success as yeah. well. Uh, they and that will that will I think uh, benefit you in the long run. Yeah. Build build up your relationships, build up your your connections, and enjoy other people's success, and it'll come back to you. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's a it's a it's the new way of thinking uh, about science. We we we're doing this as a village, yes. rather than as single investigators. Yeah, and I even think even even in the context of the old way, even with hypothesis driven, being open and sharing, and you know, the, as, as even as far as the strategy, I think it actually is the most robust anyway. I, I totally agree with you on that on that discussion, and even more so in the in the spirit of. We just have to get the promotion committees at universities to acknowledge the importance of a single data paper that a hundred other people have used. Yeah. Right. We, we still have to cross that bridge, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And they might ask, well, who is the most important person on this data paper? And <laughs> or whatever, right. I mean, that they still have to do something. And uh, and actually, there's there's a metric of, of potentially there, you know, I, I saw a competition for, you know, a metric for data sharing. Uh, you know, can you get credit that's, you know, useful on your CV for data sharing? And what sort of metric would one use? Uh, or paper sharing or things like that. Yeah. So, um, well, great. Uh, this was a great discussion and, uh, and you know, touch on so many aspects and you're doing so many just uh, wonderful things. And it seems like I really have the sense that big data is happening, but also uh, models are happening and things are moving towards the future. And, and it seems that the, the M&I or the neuro as, as it's called now is, uh, among the other consortia are, are at the forefront of this. And I'm old school. I'll, I think I'll always call it the m &I. Yeah, I think I will too, but uh, <laughs> still. But thanks again, and uh, I look forward to seeing you at the next uh, OHBM meeting. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation, Peter. It's been very enjoyable. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you.